Hi, in this video we are going to talk about conning vectors. You can find written notes on what we are going to discuss today at medicinecanbeeasy.com. The link is also in the description. So what are you going to learn in this video? I am going to explain what cloning vectors are, how they work and why they are so useful. We are also going to talk about different types of cloning vectors and their differences. Ok? So let's start. Cloning vectors are DNA molecules with inserted DNA fragments. In other words, cloning vectors are DNA molecules into which we put a DNA fragment, a short sequence of DNA that we want to clone, that we want to produce copies of. Once the DNA fragment is inserted, the cloning vector is introduced into a host cell where it can replicate. We are going to talk about how to do this in a minute, but first you should know that cloning vectors must have three important characteristics, because of course not every molecule can be a cloning vector. First, they must contain a restriction site that allows DNA fragments to be inserted. Restriction sites are short specific DNA sequences recognized and cut by restriction enzymes. If you haven't heard of restriction enzymes, maybe pause this video, go and watch our video on restriction enzymes first and then come back so that this makes sense. The second important characteristic cloning vectors need to have is an origin of replication which allows them to replicate within the host cell, because we want them to replicate the DNA we've chosen and if they cannot replicate then they would just be useless, right? And finally, they should carry a selectable marker, for example an antibiotic resistance gene can act as a selectable marker because it allows us to distinguish them from host cells that do not contain the cloning vector. Now the most important and also the first vectors developed are genetically modified bacterial plasmids. Bacterial plasmids are circular double-stranded DNA molecules that can replicate independently from the chromosomes within bacterial cells they are inserted into, which meets our second criterion that they should be able to replicate independently. Plasmids are introduced into bacteria by the process called transformation, about which we will talk in a different video. So how do we actually insert a DNA fragment into a bacterial plasmid? Well, first we cut both the plasmid DNA and the DNA we want to clone with the same restriction enzyme. DNA fragments are then inserted into the cloning vector together with DNA ligase, which you can remember from DNA replication. The sticky ends of the DNA fragments anneal and DNA ligase creates phosphodiester bonds, those are the bonds between a phosphate group and a deoxyribose to seal the nicks in the DNA backbone. The bacterial plasmid is then introduced into a bacterial host cell by transformation. Once inside the cell, the plasmid is going to replicate quickly and produce multiple copies of the DNA fragment, which is what we want. The problem with bacterial plasmids is that they are really small and for that reason they can only accept DNA fragments up to about 25 kilobases in size. And therefore, we sometimes need to use other vectors that can accept longer DNA fragments. One of these are phage vectors, for example a bacteriophage lambda, a double-stranded DNA virus which infects E. coli and that can carry DNA fragments up to 45 kilobases long. The way it is used is kind of similar to a bacterial plasmid. So we insert the DNA fragment into the phage vector, the phage can then infect bacterial host cells, it can replicate and copy the DNA fragment inserted. As you can imagine, there are also cloning vectors that can be introduced into eukaryotic cells. 
For example, a yeast artificial chromosome, a DNA molecule with a yeast origin of replication, a pair of telomeres, and a centromere can carry very long DNA fragments, and it behaves in the same way as yeast chromosomes. We also have expression vectors that are used to ensure that the mRNA of the clone gene we inserted in the DNA fragment is expressed and the proteins it encodes are produced. Because both plasmids and phage vectors usually only carry DNA fragments and do not force the cell to transcribe them into mRNA, but expression vectors do. Of course, to be able to initiate both transcription and translation of the clone gene, expression vectors contain sequences required for transcription and translation in host cells. Ok? So this is it. Thank you so much for watching. If you found this video helpful and you'd like to watch more videos on genetics or medicine in general, please subscribe. Thank you again and see you soon.